Welcome to another edition of Press Row, joined as always by Todd Walker, Aaron Matthews, Mark Kuntz. I'm Matt Finkel. Postseason is here. Kicked off the boys sectional tournaments on Tuesday. Lots of games coming up, taping this on Wednesday. Lots of games coming up tonight. Looking ahead to the weekend, which boys game are you guys most looking forward to? Well, I think mm. one of the games that we now know for certain is Elida and Bath after Bath beat Tiff and Columbian. You know, Bath beat them twice during the regular season. Elida licking their wounds over that one. I think that's going to be a good matchup to see on Friday night. Yeah, well, I'll be honest with you guys. We're in the business of promoting these games that we cover. I'm really not looking forward to any of them. I mean, I really had to look to see if there was even a halfway interesting game. You know, Bath, Elida, I, mean, I love you guys, but they've already played twice. And does, nobody really thinks they're going anywhere. I mean, Miller City, Ottoville? I mean, what are we talking about here? This is part of the playoffs? Since we <laughs> spread out the sectionals, th there really isn't a sectional final that you look at and go, wow, that's going to be an interesting game between two really good teams. But you, you've never been a big fan of promoting the sectional championship. You've always said if you win a section, if I, you're bragging no, about you're sectional right. championships, you're not much of a program. So right. I think that would serve your, your purposes then. Yeah, I'm not saying it's necessarily wrong or we should try to avoid it. You, sometimes you can't. You know, the sectional final really is designed to be a coronation of the best teams in that sectional. It, it's almost always been this way, with really the lone exception many years of that Division II at Lima Senior, where there were always a bunch of good teams in there, all from the same league. But now it's even more pronounced where the top seeds are playing even weaker competition because of just seeding the sectional. We seeded the whole district. So there really aren't a great compelling sectional final that I'm actually looking forward to in the strictest sense of the word because I literally had to look at all the brackets to find one that piqued any interest at all. I think we would be saying Perry USV had USV knocked off New Knoxville yes. on Tuesday night. That being said, from an intrigue standpoint, Perry New Knoxville for me, but from an upset alert standpoint, uh oh, Crestview Lipsick. I don't know if that would be considered an upset considering the injuries to Crestview, but I see where you're coming from. Right, and now I will say this. I've got a third game in mind, too, and I'm lucky enough that I'm going to get to call this one, and that is Delphus Jefferson mm -hmm. and Coldwater, that Division Three sectional final, the late game at St. Mary's. You know, Coldwater is, has turned the corner. They're playing much better basketball. And, you know, Delphus Jefferson has kind of hit this low the last couple of years, a team that made it to the uh, district finals in the 2000 or district semifinals in the 2009 2010 season since then they've been one and done with the exception of you know they haven't made it past the sectional can mark smith's team turn that corner against a much improved cold water team from what we've seen in years past i'll throw out another game that maybe is perhaps proving todd's point if shawnee gets past kenton which i, I think we'll have a good shot of doing that on wednesday Shawnee St. Mary's, I think, could be an interesting matchup. I think Shawnee's starting to play some pretty good basketball right now. I've liked the way St. Mary's has played throughout the year, and I know you've got a, a hot shooter in, in Derek Jay for the Rough Riders, but I, I think Shawnee with Jaden O'Neill seeing St. Mary's for a second time, I think Shawnee perhaps could pull off a, a mild upset and make it to the district. Close tournament. game the first time with Quinn Zarr in mm -hmm. the lineup. Um, Zarr has battled mono. He did not play against Ottawa Glandorf. They missed him in that game, but he, you know, they were able to keep that game close. The Titans pulled away late in the fourth there. And that mono bug is something that stays in your system quite a while, even after you've been fully cleared too. I'll give you guys two more games that I'm looking forward to. Grove, Macomb. Yes. I think that Macomb beating Collada uh, Tuesday night, this could be a good sectional final. And Minster Spencerville, not because I do think Spencerville will win, but I think that the Wildcats might be able to give the Bearcats a, a better game than some might be thinking. Moving on to girls now. Which team has the best chance of making it out of regionals next week? Boy, That's tough. I, I, I think you got to point to the, the projected OG Liberty Benton winner. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. We assume they'll meet in the district finals. Uh, no disrespect to their opponents, but if we want to play the projection game, uh, I would say that team has the best chance of actually winning the regional. But you look at the Division II, uh, we certainly hope and feel that it'll most likely be Bath, but could be Wapakoneta. But then Toledo Rogers is sitting there, a yeah. prohibitive favorite. That to would be come the regional semifinal. Would be the, yeah, yeah, assuming semis. Toledo Rogers and so, whoever comes out. Single game at Ohio Northern, by the way, yeah. on that one too, on on Tuesday the tenth. Yep. Yeah, and I, you know the Crestview girls are undefeated, so I guess you'd have to look to them as as a possibility. But you know, uh, 
it's not looking like we got a, a banner year for a girls team from this area getting out of regional. You know, you talk Crestview girls and, you know, look at their opponent in the, in the semis, and it's Ottoville, a team that I don't think you can sleep on either just because they're, they're a proven commodity, a proven program that has been there. They've done that. They've got the pedigree, so to speak, if you will, that, you know, to, to grind through a game. Uh, like at the district level and make it to a district final. But I think Crestview, as you said, could get by them. But I think that that D3 district winner, who comes out of that? And I'm not saying it's going to be one. It could be Coldwater. It could be LCC. Somebody gets hot at the right time. I think just looking at the brackets, that the D3 girls winner is the one that gets out of regional and could potentially go to Columbus. But, you know, Bath, obviously we want to see Bath or Wapakoneta, you know, you still got Defiance in the mix. That's who Bath is going to play. But that Toledo Rogers team is just beyond loaded. Yeah, I think a couple of times the last few years we've kind of sit, sat here and said, oh, I, I don't see a, a great girls basketball team yet. It seems like every year somebody does get on a run and makes it down to Columbus. So it's just a matter of who's going to get hot right now. And I'm, I'm going to go with Liberty Benton. I, I think with the combination of Simon and Cody and DeVicentes gives them a, a three players who can score. That's uh, tough to stop at any level of high school basketball. LCC is going to have their hands full with yeah. them, but I also know that... Uh, and LB uh, is comfortable playing a slower pace or yeah. an up-tempo pace, which serves them well in the postseason because they can play to whatever their opponent wants to do. L I know L LCC lo likes to run, but I think LB cannot run them. And Madison Stolle, if she's in the gym, she's in range for LCC. Yeah. Well, that's, that's what you like about LCCs. I mean, they've got the puncher's chance. Yep. They can shoot it. Yep. They can get hot, and they can put up 70, 75 points, making a bunch of threes and pulling upsets. So yeah. you, you got to give them a puncher's chance. Uh, real quick about LCC, Sydney Santaguita, the senior guard, set the school record for assists. She has over 320 career assists now. And Madison Stolle already getting looks, high D2, some D1 looks also as just a sophomore uh, based on what she's done this year. We mentioned her being in the gym. She's in range, and I think... It's either her or Kayla Veerhoff. I believe it is uh, Madison Stolle has um, either tied the three-point record or is one away from tying the school record for threes in a season two. Yeah, Verhoff's had a great season too. I'm really looking forward to that LCC LB game. Nobody mentioned Marion Local. I think they they have a chance, an outside chance uh, as the one seed. They got to get through Ada. And what Bill yeah, Tapper has done Mark, at Ada. Mark Shine and I were talking about that. Ada is kind of an underdog that nobody was paying attention to. They can make a run here. Taft, Taft knew what he was doing when he when he went after that job and got that gig over at Ada. And you know he inherited a great group of girls, a very solid team coming back. You know from what they've had in the past and. You know, that's a team that if they do what they do, they could knock off Marion Local. I they, don't think Marion Local's got it easy, and I think Treva Forkamp knows that as well. The Ada got off to a great start, had a little bit of a rocky patch in the middle of the season, but now they're starting to play well again, and this obviously is the time you want to be doing that. So, yeah, I, th I think Ada could perhaps be a sleeper team that could maybe make a deeper run. Mm -hmm. All right, let's talk college hoops now. It's March, so March Madness. We have our own version with high school, but everyone, the nation, getting excited for March Madness college hoops. Careful has, when you say everyone. Okay, everyone with the exception of uh, Mark Cates. I think there's a lot of people who aren't getting very excited over college basketball All right, anymore. so that brings us to the question. Has college basketball lost its luster? Absolutely. I disagree with you. Well, I, I think it's been this way for a while, and I, I, I think I'm mostly agreeing with Mark in the fact that the regular season, nobody really cares anymore because nobody cares about anything but the tournament. That is part of it. And also, it's widely talked about in the national press, the the quality of play or the pace of play or the low scoring in college hoops and and it is a problem a lot of the games are aesthetically not pleasing certainly wouldn't take a casual fan and make them go wow look how fun this is uh, it is a problem and they're going to have to do something about it and i know that they're talking about it trying to tweak the rules or you know move the shot clock or something uh, make a way lane wider but there's definitely a problem aesthetically. But I think once the tournament starts, people kind of put that aside just because of the drama and the meaning of the tournament. But I think there is some luster off of that. I had to do five and five again this week, guys. I guess the first time it went pretty well, so you guys asked <laughs> me to do a second one. And this was one of the questions that I discussed. And I said, you know, I don't think it has, and here's why. People want to see teams, i.e. Kentucky, but they, you don't off. have teams anymore. You've right. got collections of four guys 
that will go to one place for one year and nobody, you don't get invested into the teams anymore because of the one and done rule. Guys are coming in for one year. College coaches are catering to, we got to get this guy in. He, we're only going to have him for one year, so we're going to let him run the program for one year. I'm not going to be able to get my system in because i got to do what this guy is capable of doing, and then he's gone the next year. So you're not invested into teams. You're not invested into programs like you were even 10, 15 years ago. I see wholeheartedly where you're coming from, Mark, we, we and, don't, I, and we, I agree to we an don't extent, see, too. We don't see you know, how Duke progressed. We don't see right. how even UNLV, how all those guys came back in 91 and became the greatest villains of college basketball because they came back and Duke beat them then in the national semifinals. We don't have those storylines anymore. Even that team up north when, you know, they replaced him as the villains with the Fab Five. Chris Webber, when he left, you still had Jalen Rose and Jawan Howard come back. Ray and Jackson Jimmy King. and Jimmy King and Ray Jackson stayed two more years after that sophomore year. But here's why I said that people want to see teams lose. The number one trending top thing on Twitter Tuesday night between 1030 and 1130 was Kentucky, Georgia, because Georgia had them on the ropes. People didn't think George would be the team that would do it. Georgia had the lead late. They lost the lead. Kentucky hangs on by the skin of their teeth, gets the win on the road. Before you get too enamored with what's trending on Twitter, hmm. Twitter's not ne necessarily a great barometer for what oh, really I, the country is feeling. I, I will agree with you on that as well, but it's just I think that people are in, I mean, I think it will as it, we get in more into the Big Ten tournament, these conference tournaments, get into the NCAA tournament, that's when you're going to see the people enthralled. Yeah, Mark, you made very valid point. Absolutely. Absolutely a valid point. I watched Duke UNC earlier in the year. That game was electric. So oh, much yes. fun to Best watch. Oh, yes, best college game of the year. And as we get into these tournaments where the teams are playing each other that know each other and you're going to have some good finishes, and then the whole aspect of the, the Cinderella team and taking a team into the tournament with the chance of winning six games in a row and being the best team in college basketball, you can't replace that. And I still, I still get excited about that, and I think the general population would agree with me, but I don't know. I can't speak for everyone, obviously. Anyway, moving on to the NBA, Cleveland Cavaliers, two-thirds of the season done for them. Are they where they need to be? Three quarters of the season. Three quarters of the season. They got 20 games left. It's moving ahead. Forget that. I like where they are, you know, notwithstanding their recent slip-ups of LeBron skipping a game or Kyrie with his shoulder. Assuming everything is well, they're all healthy, I like where they are. I think bringing in Mozgov was a great find. I think they might have stumbled into it accidentally, but, hey, it worked out. But you know, there's always going to be potential issues with this team because they, they haven't played together very long. How are they going to react in a tough playoff series? All that remains to be seen. But I think the way the roster's built now and the attitude that they have moving forward and the, the way they've played of late shows that uh, right now they're about as good a spot as you could have hoped for. You know, one of the things that I'm, I've thought about this question when I saw it was, Yes, I think they are, but two things. Number one, 11 of the 15 guys on their roster were not a part of this team a year ago. But number two, the thing that I think could hold them back was something I noticed on Sunday when they played Houston, and that was the fact that it was LeBron James and four other guys on the floor. Everybody was standing with their right. hands on the hips. They were running a five-out offense, and it was like, okay, LeBron, run ISO and do something. You cannot do this. Teams are too good in the NBA, except for Denver to make the adjustment. Well, Aaron, you're right. I noticed the same thing, and it was bad, and LeBron missed six straight shots and missed and three out of four throws. free yeah. throws. Yeah. But the, the main reason they had to do that is because Kyrie Irving was yep. not playing. If Irving is not playing, LeBron is going to monopolize the ball for bad or for good. Yep. And you're right. I think they need Irving if they're going to win a championship because he can get LeBron off all that ball handling duty. He'll be much more dynamic. And Irving can create things and run the show. I think they're much better that, that way. That Mozgov deal when they picked up him from Denver I thought was huge and has paid good dividends and has allowed Tristan Thompson, even though his minutes are reduced compared to what they've been, yeah, adapt in a, as a sixth man. I think he's done an outstanding job and is and arguably one of the most unheralded players this year in the NBA, just what he's brought coming off the bench for Cleveland. My concern with the Cavs is the same it was in August, in September, and October. Who's their head coach? David Blatt. David Blatt. How many career playoff victories does he have? Well, he hasn't. He's his in first the year in the NBA. Zero. Exactly. First year head coach. Well, let him get to the playoffs. You get Let's into see. the playoffs. I think he's going to get out coached. That type of thing gets exposed over a longer series. They're going to have home court advantage for the first round. Second round, they need to get some business taken care of in the last couple of weeks to get a home court in the second round. But I, I like where they are right now. But you got to remember what LeBron said when he announced he was coming back 
going to be a process. Right. He, he may be, it was hedging his bets by saying it's going to be a long process, but he didn't think back in, in the summer that it was going to be a championship year right off the bat. 19 games left. They've got Toronto Wednesday night. They've got Atlanta on Friday night. Obviously, a win, the huge win that they got over Boston where they ran them off the floor Tuesday night helps. They do the same tonight at Toronto, a team that you know has been up and down throughout the year. And then going into a showdown on Friday night with Atlanta, they beat Atlanta. I think that begins the upswing to the two seed. Yeah, they're fourth right now. They yes. would be yeah. fourth. They'd be the last. They would be the last team to get a home and, and, game. And they're just what, like a half game behind Chicago. Yeah, no, yeah, they're only game well, Chicago, one so. game out of second place. So mm -hmm. obviously, lock and change. I think they need to leapfrog Chicago for sure, though. With Rose and Butler out, yes. you can't stay behind them. If Chicago is right for the picking right yeah. now. All right, so we'll keep an eye on that as they make their way towards the postseason. That's all the time we have for this edition of Press Row. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week.